Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every night, I'm going to try to get to as many questions as I possibly can. Um, but uh, until then, hi, mom and dad. How are you? Nice to see you. Oh, good. We're just We're great. Good. Yeah. Especially, <laughs> see behind us, see the Hawaiian <laughs> Islands. <laughs> Well, the reason we have them there is because that's where everything started. In the McDougal program, my initial practice, you know, the Hawaii Medical Library, I learned everything. We had our three children there in Hawaii. Lived on uh, the Big Island for three years, lived on Oahu for 11, 11 years, yeah, or 12. 12. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And we had a great time. And we just went back for a family vacation last for the last two weeks. Yeah, got a little yeah. suntan. Change some of my physical appearance. Everybody <laughs> said it would be okay. But anyway, <clears throat> we're back from a, a, a great time with the, with the family. You know, that's one of the great fortunes in Mary's and my life is that we have three wonderful children and seven amazing grandkids who uh, just had the time of their life. And they went, um, <laughs> well, they went scuba diving. They uh, went snorkeling. They have uh, rides on an electric uh, Windsurfer, so to speak. Oh, it's a what is it? What's what is it e, 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 e foil. E foil did some riding through the canopies. It, it was a good time, and you know nothing more fun than watching your kids and grandkids have a good time and getting together for a vacation. And I spent a little time in the sun, probably a tiny bit too much, although although I was careful. And uh, my skin is designed for the latitude of forty two degrees. And we made we went we moved to a latitude of twenty two degrees in Hawaii. Is that what Hawaii is? Twenty two degrees. Twenty two degrees latitude. Oh, that's a big difference. <laughs> so anyway, you know that's the kind of skin we have. We have just you know lily white skin, and so we have to be especially careful when we uh, when we make a trip like this. And <clears throat> I, I got tanned. Uh, I got a, a tiny bit burned. How much did it take? <laughs> At noon, it took a half an hour a day. That was basically what I did. That was almost too much. It was almost too much, yeah. Sometimes I got busy talking to the grandkids and they'd move out of the sun as quickly as possible. But anyway, I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about sunshine today. And, uh, you know, since it seems uh, uh, quite appropriate. <laughs> really? Uh, and then we go on to some questions. I, I always want to remind you that everything looked good, Heather. Everything's great. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I, I always want to remind you that, you know, I've been in this business for, you know, over over 50 years. And I learned a lot of things. And, you know, that's what I can share with you is I have experience. And uh, I've worked really hard. <clears throat> so uh, I want you to look at the things that I have to say and decide whether or not I'm, I'm right. Or I exaggerate things or it is a way it should or could be. You know, I'm I'm your I'm your doctor. I'm a physician. I'm a teacher. So take advantage of it and look up the research that I talked to you about on on these presentations and others. And when you go to YouTube, you'll find a lot of material that I presented. And I present the references. And you can go first. You go to PubMed.org, the National Library of Medicine. What you find is the uh, DOI number, Digital Op Object Identifier. And then you place that digital optic identifier in a website called SciHub. And SciHub has you know, almost all the articles. And uh, it's an organization that puts the articles uh, up on the web, makes them available for us. I have the extra availability because I'm a, an assistant clinical professor at, I don't know, two, three, four medical schools. So I get access to the libraries, but that helps, but this is as good, if not better. So you can look up all the research papers. You can see whether or not this is really true. The things I, I talked about. Can I ask one question? Hmm. Where do you find the DOI? The DOI, where you find that first you go to pubmed.org and it lists in the uh, reference section under your citations, the DOI number, you won't miss it. Oh, okay. You know, it's right, right, it's right there under so obvious. Oh, yeah. It is the most important number as far as looking up references go. Okay. So uh, get involved. This is uh, your life. And uh, even though that I tell you it's true. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so uh, let's talk about uh, sunshine and vitamin D. 
for a little bit. Uh, vitamin D is really not a vitamin. A vitamin is a, a small organic substance that the body does not make. It's, it's vital. You have to get it from outside the body. And in this case, it's plants. And the other exception is B12, which is made by bacteria. But otherwise, 11 of the 13 known vitamins are, are made by plants. Vitamin B12 is made by bacteria. We've talked about that a lot. And, and vitamin D is actually made by ourselves. And if it's made by ourselves, it's not a vitamin, it's a hormone. And so we get this as a consequence of sunshine uh, being exposed to our skin. And it's not just our skin, you know, animals that have, for example, fish that have vitamin D in them, this is a source of vitamin D, uh, their, their skin also synthesizes the vitamin D. And do they get it when that like swims close to the surface? They the get, sun gets out? Sun gets on. That's how they, that's how. So <clears throat> basically all vitamin D comes as a consequence of all their violet, violet radiation on various animals, including fish. And also that's mostly vitamin D3. And the form vitamin D2 is made by irradiating mushrooms. And both are of, uh, of uh, importance and both are potent. But where you want to get your sunshine from is the skin. How much exposure do you have to have? Just enough to make your skin a little inflamed. And somebody as white skinned as I am, that, that, that uh, is seen by a little discoloration, a little pigmentation. If you're darker skinned, it may be a little more difficult to recognize, but hey, it, the beginning of the inflammation is enough. And anything more than that, you're not gonna produce any more vitamin D. You know, that's it for the day. You can burn yourself to a crisp and you're not gonna make any more vitamin D. It's just the first few minutes of exposure that makes a difference. <clears throat> and the things that make a difference is how close you are to the equator, which of course I told you, I went from 42 degrees latitude to 22 degrees, and that made a big difference. Uh, pollution. I mean, we have tremendous pollution going across the United States today because of the fires in Canada. The pollution makes a big difference. How, how much uh, exposure you allow to yourself because of the number of clothes you wear, whether or not you go out in the daytime or nighttime or work in the day or nighttime, <clears throat> that all makes a difference. So even the, the way the air is in some parts of the country right now, it's so yeah. polluted that you you could stay out longer, oh, or yes. you or yeah. you still have to be careful about how. Well, uh, you know you, the the um, in part, particulate matter gets in, in the way of sunshine exposure, so the ultraviolet light does not reach your skin, okay. or it's absorbed or reflected back. Anyway, you you don't need a lot of sunshine because vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. That's why they put it in whole milk. It's added to whole milk. Milk does not have vitamin D in it. It's a vitamin in the form of a vitamin pill. But it's a fat-soluble vitamin. And so what you do during your summer vacation, like the two weeks I just spent, I made enough vitamin D to last myself the entire year. If I if I got onto a nuclear submarine and went under the polar caps for 14 months and didn't get a bit of sunshine, I'd still have enough vitamin D that I made during this last vacation. So sunshine is the way to get your vitamin D and uh, it supplies, well, most of vitamin D. You can get some from food. You can get some from taking supplements. Uh, as far as vitamin D tests are concerned, <clears throat> there, there, there's a testing which has created a big business. Um, and it's part of the disease mongering part. Back, back when I was growing up, we used to call vitamin D the sunshine vitamin. But now people think of vitamin D as taking shots or pills, primarily pills, supplements. No, it's the sunshine vitamin. And so we have this big campaign <clears throat> to get enough vitamin D, mostly by pills. And so we've set up standards as to whether you are sufficient or insufficient as far as your vitamin D levels. And this is based on a test that's done. And you can see uh, the various levels that are, are uh, listed here. Definite deficiency, uh, less than uh, 10 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, you get into the 20 to 29 range. Uh, most, most people consider that significant. But sometimes some people, some standards, particularly those that I've noticed are selling supplements, want you to be 30 nanograms per milliliter or greater. Yeah. And, and there are some people who even recommend that you should go up to 
90 or 120 milligrams per deciliter. But the only way you can get there is by taking supplements. And, and the uh, important thing to, to understand is these, the, these values are of very little importance to you except to get, drag you to the supplement business. You, you may decide that based on your value that you should get more sunshine. That's the right decision you should make. Expose your skin to more sunshine. It shouldn't be taking pills as we'll get into. Uh, let me show you how unfavorable vitamin D testing is. Uh, the United States Preventative Services Task Force, the most reliable information on health that people in the United States get, uh, they don't recommend it. They, the U.S. Uh, in 2021, they conclude that the current evidence is insufficient to assess the balance of benefits and harms of screening for vitamin D deficiency in asymptomatic people. So they, they, they told you not to get the test. And Medicare, likewise, beginning in March 1st, 2022, they didn't pay for preventative screening. So, so you can see how, how much value this test is as far as your health is concerned. The people who are mainly interested in you getting these tests done are the laboratories, the doctors you visit, and those who sell you supplements. You know, it's another business. It's free, safe. Sunshine never produces too much vitamin D. So you don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> uh, depending upon your uh, skin pigmentation depends upon how much sunshine you need. And usually you get within the first 20 minutes of sun exposure is enough. Uh, <clears throat> white people compared to Asian Indians uh, require, Asian Indians require three times as much and people who would be considered black uh, they require 10 times as much exposure as whites do. When you uh, consider your vitamin D levels, it's not just the amount of sunshine that you get. It also has to do with how, how well or ill you are. When you have chronic illness, what happens is you produce chronic inflammation. When I'm talking about chronic illness, arthritis, uh, other autoimmune diseases, uh, diabetes, just being overweight produces this chronic inflammation. And one of the byproducts of chronic inflammation is a substance, a few substances that actually lower your vitamin D level. So even though you may go out and get a lot of sunshine, et cetera, if you're not trim and in good health, and the only way I know of you getting good health is to, is to fix the problem, which is the food, then you really can't say that you are not getting enough vitamin D. You have to cure the diabetes, which you do with a starch-based diet, cure the obesity, which you do with a starch-based diet, cure the autoimmune inflammatory diseases, which you do with a starch-based diet. And it may take you a few months, and then you get a better assessment of what your real vitamin D levels are. But I certainly wouldn't panic as long as they're above 20. <clears throat> uh, what it turns out in testing as far as preventing fractures, it turns out that only elderly isolated white women benefit from vitamin D supplementation. In other words, the most needy of all, white women who are in, in institutions that don't get enough sunshine, uh, they're the ones that do show an actual benefit from vitamin D supplements, but you must understand that these supplements have to be combined with calcium. Or, or there's no benefit. So vitamin D alone is not even gonna help these people. But if you combine it with calcium, what happens is because the calcium pill is an antacid. And I've talked to you about how the reason you get weak bones, osteoporosis, is because you're eating acidic foods. So <clears throat> the, the vitamin D business has become so great that um, it's claimed that vitamin D cures everything, Alzheimer's disease, menopausal symptoms, oh, just you name it, it cures it. And what they're trying to do is talk you into taking pills. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is these weak bones are, are really due to high acid foods. That's how you get osteoporosis. The, uh, <clears throat> the reason you can claim everything and anything is caused by lack of vitamin D is because of a confounding factors. And I'll see if I can explain this to you 
And as you uh, move away from the equator, diseases become more common, like more obesity, more heart disease, more diabetes, more multiple sclerosis, et cetera, as you move north and south to the equator. Well, as you move north and south to the equator, you have low or high levels of vitamin D because of sunshine exposure. But you also, and this is a confounding factor, you also have a change in diet. People who live around the equator eat primarily starch-based diets, which is, that's really the cause of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, et cetera, is the animal food diet that people switch to as they move north and south from the equator. So, so that's why you see an association. And that's why vitamin D fails when you try and solve the problems with supplements. For example, study in 2014, they looked at the effect of vitamin D. And, and I'm not pulling literature on your cherry, cherry picking. You can look this stuff up. You'll find absolute consistency in what I'm going to tell you. In this particular study, they looked at uh, vitamin D experiments were done giving somewhere between 300 daily and 300,000 as one dose of vitamin D. And, and what they found is that there was no benefit to the skeleton or cancer or heart disease or strokes. And, and that's what happens when you see it. And the reason is, is it's not the lack of vit vitamin D. It's, it's the confounding factor that you're eating an animal food-based diet. All right. So commonly people believe that vitamin D supplements prevent falls and fractures. Well, let's take a look at the literature. A uh, big study published in 2022 <clears throat> shows that uh, compared to placebo, there was no difference in fractures. This is a large randomized controlled trial. Uh, there's no dissenting information. This is giving 2,000 international units a day. The, the common supplements are 5,000 international units a day. And this is one of the major studies published just recently. It was a year ago. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. No difference, no benefit as far as the incidence of fractures. And then we have also uh, papers that tell us that when you take more than 1,000 international units of vitamin D a day as a supplement, you actually can increase your risk of falls and fractures. And there are multiple studies that show this. I've listed a whole bunch of them for you. You can spend the, the whole day looking them up just as I showed you at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, the, one of the problems with vitamin D, as I told you, is that it's fat soluble. So it accumulates in your body fat. And the half-life of vitamin D is about 15 days. So whatever you take day one, it takes 15 days for half of it to go away. Well, if you take it every day, then what happens is it bioaccumulates. And, and so you may start out with, say, 5,000 units the first day, but, you know, half is only gone 15 days later. And then you've got the 5,000 units you take the next day, which 15 later is half gone. Anyways, it just keeps adding up to the point where you, you get into a situation where you develop toxicity. But 50,000 units daily for five weeks, you become toxic but you can run into all kinds of problems with greater than 1,000 to 2,000 international units. All right, Heather, that's enough on vitamin D. Don't take the pills. They're <laughs> dangerous. And get some sunshine, but be careful. Uh, it's, it's, it's the way we've always looked at things. It's always been the sunshine vitamin. Never is going to change. And if you, uh, if you disobey Mother Nature, you're likely to pay the price. And that means increased falls and fractures and other problems. There are all kinds of things associated with taking extra too much vitamin D, not, not just falls and fractures. That's the thing that's so surprising because taking the supplement actually creates nutritional imbalances, imbalances in the activity of your muscles and nerves. And so you fall. Yeah. So if you're going to take vitamin D, you know, maybe 600 units, maybe at most 1,000. But, but no more than that. Uh, best advice, of course, is get out in the sunshine. Okie dokie. Thank you. A uh, quick question about vitamin D. This came in from P2 while you were talking. What happens to the extra vitamin D that we are accumulating? Store, store it in the body fat. That's, and then you develop you know, very high levels in the body fat and they come out. 
That's why you can go, you know, whole whole year without being in the sunshine. You don't develop rickets or osteomalacia, which are the some of the, some of the common consequences of vitamin D deficiency. You develop osteomalacia and rickets. Of course, the very serious serious problem of children and adults. Uh, they get weaker bones. They would call it osteomalacia, but it's different than osteoporosis. So that's what happens to the extra. And as I say, it bioaccumulates because it's, it has a half-life of 15 days. It's stored in the fat. The next day you take another pill. It's stored in the fat. The next day you take another pill. Stored in the fat. And each day you have, it takes 15 days for half of that dose to go away. You just get into a point where you get easily into toxic levels and you're doing yourself no good, probably some serious harm. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question has actually come in a few times over the past week. Uh, it came in tonight from Mr. Backyard Engineer, and he wants to know um, how you read, understand, and evaluate the quality of research papers. You talk oh. about that a lot. There's a lot of different papers out there, and you have a way of discovering which ones are nonsense and which ones to pay attention to. Can you talk about well, that I have a, a bit? Basic core beliefs. That I reference everything off of. I mean, you know, this is the way I look at the world. And so you have to understand I do have a particular bias that I go into every, every research paper with. One of the first things I look at is who funded the paper. 70% of the drug research is funded by the pharmaceutical industry. 70% of the food research is funded by the food industry. So you know they're not going to pay for that particular research team again if they don't show the results that they're looking for to increase profits. It just makes basic sense. In fact, it used to be that the uh, pharmaceutical companies had full control of whether or not a paper got published. So if researchers, good researchers, did a study and it didn't turn out showing benefits of their particular product, they just nixed it. It was done. But that's not allowed anymore. So even the the, the negative studies you can find with difficult, you got to know where to look. So uh, I, I do that. And then I particularly like randomized control trials. Everybody likes randomized control trials. And what that means is you take a large group of people, you divide them into two groups that look equal, same weight, same age, whether or not they take the same medications. You divide them into two groups that, you know, basically look, look the same. And you have one group and you tell them to keep doing the things you've been doing. And you have another group called the intervention group. Like, for example, in this case, you'd be giving vitamin D supplements, or you could be doing heart surgery, like we've talked about, uh, or breast cancer surgery, like we're going to be talking about. So those are particularly good studies. And, you know, sometimes you can't figure out the bias of a person because commonly researchers list no conflict of interest when they really do have a conflict. And so I'll sometimes search back at previous papers they published where they have declared the conflict of interest. They work for some, you know, osteoporosis business. And you have to some, sometimes kind of dig deep. But again, because of my bias, if it doesn't fit in with what, you know, I have a good reason to believe. I start looking for how they cheated. <laughs> and pretty much always I find how they cheated. You know, I, I've been doing this a long time, folks. I, I've got no vested interests. In fact, there was a, just a, a show that was done, and there was another another physician. I've never met him, but and my name came up, and it, they were talking about supplements. And the comment they made, that he made, a very respected doctor, was, you know, Dr. McDougall never sold supplements. And with his reputation, he could have been a multi-multi-millionaire if he'd done so. But I haven't, don't, won't, because, you know, I, not that I don't want to have enough money to pay tuition <laughs> for the kids to go to school. You know, I have to have some basic needs satisfied too, but enough's enough. I'm a doctor because I love being a doctor. You know, I love helping people. Well, I remember years ago you had opportunities to do this and yeah. you always refused. You know, I, I've had many, many opportunities from food companies and pharmaceutical companies, mostly supplement companies, for me to. <clears throat> And we're talking about millions of dollars, so I, I haven't. I it's worked out really well. I don't mind <laughs> at all. 
So dad, no. sometimes you're criticized because you use research that's from the eighties. Oh yeah. And well, people, no, people were smart back in the eighties <laughs> and they were smart back in, you know, 1920. These were good people who did good research. And the, the thing is, it's the basic stuff. And if it were repeated, then they're not going to repeat it because it's already been shown by several investigators to be true. And it doesn't fit in with what they're trying to prove. But the basic science is done, was done back in the, in the 1900s. You know, and, and that's why I use research from 1980, 1970, 1930, 1920, because it's good, good data. It's true. You will find if you if you look for research in the in the 2020s, either you won't find it or you'll find that it supports exactly what I say. In fact, often in the bottom right hand corner, you'll find not only the basic old research, but I'll show you where there's similar research published within say, the same, say the past five years, just to answer the criticism of what this person asked. The truth is the truth. The, the earth will always be round. <laughs> Ain't going to change. <laughs> I don't care whether you, you came to that conclusion 300 years ago or you know 30 days from now. It's always going to be round, folks. The earth does not, <laughs> the sun does not rotate around the earth. Well, I know there are people out there that believe so. <laughs> These are called conspiracy, conspiracy theorists. They're, they run wild. It's not just in politics. You have these people who run wild in, in medicine, nutrition, you know, and they lie. Basically, they are lying. And, uh, you know, I know how to catch them. And I've caught a good share of them. And that's been part of my career over the years. Barry Sears. And, you know, and what's that, Nancy or Nina? Nina Tolsky. Yeah. Anyway, there have been a few people that have, have deserved my attention to take and show the public that. Robert Atkins, you know, I've certainly put a lot of work into discrediting well, his nonsense. And I should mention that and public debates. Well, there's, there's some doctor who criticized you forever, and oh yeah, completely adver uh, advocated something oh, yeah. completely different. And all of a sudden, he just changed his mind completely. Yeah. Uh, when Nick, Nick the vegan, you can look up. He did a an audio on this. How, how Mercola. It was the number one quack in the United <laughs> States. I mean, he was declared by some big news company to be the number one quack selling, you know, I don't know, $100 million worth of supplements. I don't think I'm very far off. Anyway, well, he, he and I have been dealing at a, somewhat of a distant level. You know, we never had a chance to debate. He's never had me on his show. I've never had him on, on my show, Mercola, M-E-R-C-O-L-A. But but we've known a lot about each other over the years, and I uh, have you know taken the trouble on occasion to you know specifically and in general to say a lot of things he says are nonsense, like believing in low carb diets. Well, there's a paper that's just published. In fact, I'll talk about it in the next few weeks, showing that. Well, I, I can show you four review papers, and I've shown them to you before, and they have shown to you recently. Four review papers that looked at the risk of dying and dying from heart disease. They're, they're meta-analyses, they're, they're reviews, they look into a whole bunch of studies, and they're, and they're from different journals, and they all say the same thing. And in terms of heart disease and dying from heart disease, well, what, what McCullough discovered was a paper that just came out, and I haven't gotten it yet, I, I asked one of the libraries from one of the medical schools I'm associated with. I asked him to send me that paper, and I haven't gotten it yet, but the paper talks about uh, middle age and elderly people having a dramatic increase in dying on low carb diets. And that's what changed Mercola's attitude about low carb diets. That's what we're talking about. You can look up, look, look, Nick the Vegan and, Mick, was it Nick the Vegan? Heather, do you remember? I don't remember, but I was I was reading there watching that same well, just video. Look, just, uh, <laughs> well, you can try the, I think uh, it's what's, Nick. Nick the Vegan. Nick. You know, he's, 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 he, of course, he's a vegan and he promotes and does a lot of good work. But um, he brought out this issue with Mercola, which is kind of important because, like I say, he's reached worldwide attention as the number one quack in the United States. Yeah, I think for him to change his mind is, is rather dramatic. Well, you know what? 
you can only lie to yourself for so long. <laughs> when, when your own mortality is at risk, uh, you better start listening to the truth. These diets are dangerous. And I was just thinking, I'm, I'm 76 years old, and we just got to had this wonderful vacation with the kids. I went on boats, and kids went scuba diving, and snorkeling, and I just had really a lot of fun walking on the beach and swimming in the pool. You know, uh, Atkins died at 71. <laughs> Beat that sucker by five years. <laughs> It's all about living well, right, Dad? Well, you know, and, and a little good luck. I don't know. But I, I think it, the diet had a major role because he died of heart disease. He died of a heart, congestive heart failure, and uh, which is a result of disease of his small vessels. But, it'd be, you know, I had his angiograms. I don't know whether I could get them again, but I had them. They were lost uh, in the fires. But uh, he had horrible atherosclerosis, Atkins did. And he lied. You know, goes on Larry King and lies. He says he doesn't have any artery disease or heart disease. And, uh, you know, I caught him a few times. Yes, I did. So let's get back to some questions. I've got one from Betty, and she wrote in. And she's wondering, she says, what do I do after you? I fell for stents in the heart and one in my kidney? Is yeah. it too late? Is there any hope? No, I, no, and and the stint to your kidneys may have improved your kidney function, you know, and and that's passed. And stints to the heart can uh, can reduce or stop chest pain, but they don't save lives. You know, that's the thing you need to know. Why? Because people continue to to shovel the garbage in their arteries. They don't know any better. Back in the hospital, they're served the very foods that brought them there. So yeah, you could you could do a tremendous amount of good. You could stop the progression of artery disease and reverse a lot of it. There are lots of the, the artery disease that can't be reversed. As I, I talked to you about over the last uh, three weeks, you know, there are old scars, calcifications and scars. But there's a lot of the, a lot of the disease that can be reversed. The, the acute problems, the swelling, the pustules, you know, they can be reversed. So uh, when you stop, when you stop throwing gasoline on fire, basically, you know, things get better. Your body's always trying to heal. It, it, the problem is, is your healing mechanisms are not, not strong enough. I mean, they're really strong, but they're not strong enough to overcome the damage from the smoking, from the fork and spoon. So you see the disease progress. The body's still trying to heal. Nothing changes. But when you stop the damage, then the healing aspect overtakes the damage and you can see the other direction. That's what you want to do. And you will see it. I mean, I'll, did I say I would guarantee? No, I'm not going to guarantee. <laughs> but I'll pretty much, uh, I'll pretty much, be, I, I just think it, it, it's so unlikely that you're not going to trem improve tremendously from changing to a starch-based diet. And, you, and the results are within a week, certainly 12 days, I would report. Oh, and there were 12 days. In fact, we have a 12 day program coming up here in a couple of weeks that will help you. We'll, we're, our, our medical doctor will help you. I'll help you. Our support staff will help you. We'll get you over this. You'll look back and say, Why didn't I do this before? <laughs> I'm off, you know, I'm off enough drugs to pay for the entire program. You know, it really is. Or you can do it free. It's on our website, the to its 12 day program on the website. But we're here to help you. And, uh, not only do we help you for the 12 days where we intently work with you, our whole crew, you know, every aspect that we think is important in terms of health and healing, but we're with you for uh, one year or love or more if you'd like, but included is uh, the opportunity for us to support you for a year. And you ain't got it by then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, usually what they say is uh, when you establish a behavior for six months, then it's a permanent change. So we're going to get you through it. Anyway, that's Ju was July. What, what is it, Heather? July 14th is our next course, and we're filling up. Uh, July 14th, 2023. That's only I, a few days. Yeah, I, I look forward to it. We have uh, so much fun. You know, uh, Mary and I, we get together, and Heather, Mary and I and Heather get together every morning at uh, 8 o'clock. And we, we nine, talk to nine It's 9 o'clock. It's 9 o'clock. Okay, it's 9 o'clock. And we talk to people all over the world, you know, Shanghai and Moscow and you know, <laughs> Sydney and all over the world. And uh, we have that chance to have a very informal conversation. And it gets kind of personal sometimes. That's a lot of fun.
Okay, next question. Um, <clears throat> this is from someone that is looking, well, dreading a knee replacement and is wondering if there's any way that they can avoid it or if it's something that's inevitable. Well, it's probably inevitable. Uh, I, I assume you're at a point of, of tremendous pain and disability. But, but you know, it may not be the case. Why don't you give it till you lose the extra body fat? I mean, carrying around that extra extra weight on that knee is what's causing a lot of the pain. And also there's an anti-inflammatory aspect mm -hmm. to eating a healthy diet, which reduces the pain in the joint. But, you know, you, what, you, what you're telling me is, the a usual situation where the joint is so damaged that the way to get improvement is a replacement. Mm -hmm. And when, when we first started out with these maybe 20, 25 years ago, the results were terrible. The hips were good. You know, hip replacements, uh, what I was doing well in Hawaii in 1972, we were doing hip, hip replacements. But anyway, they perfected the knee to the point where I, I've seen people over and over again who thinks it's one of the best things they did. You know, there's some wonderful things in modern medicine. You just have to be careful to pick and choose. So I would do that. Regardless, uh, changing your diet pre-op is really important because you have less risk of complications, less risk of anesthesia death, less risk of uh, blood clots in your legs, give you a pulmonary embolus. You're a better surgical candidate because you can imagine cutting through all that fat to get to what you're trying to work on. And then that's all covered with fat is a real chore for the surgeon. You remember Mary was a surgical nurse, you know, and when I met her and I put myself through medical school as a surgical nurse, I've seen thousands of operations. Yeah, much more difficult. Fat people but. are hard to operate on, <laughs> so get thin. And by the way, but. I found out this, this past week that fat is the proper way. It's an adjective. Obesity refers to a disease, and overweight refers to an established weight that you're supposed to be at. Did I get that completely? So. Yeah. Those are official, politically <laughs> correct terms. Fat is an adjective. Obese describes disease, and overweight means there's a reference that you should be at, which you're not at right now. So don't be fat anymore. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I don't want to offend anybody. You know, Mary. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Um, let's see. So many coming in. Um, this one was written in, um, and this is in uh, response to your article on al Alzheimer's disease and aluminum. And they're yes. wondering, you talked about um, drinking a certain type of water. Um, so, what so kind good. of water and how much should they drink every day? Well, it's silica water. And what you would drink is like one bottle. Uh, that, I mean, that will show, uh, I mean, they've shown, uh, I think it's an eight ounce bottle that uh, you actually remove a considerable amount of aluminum by having, and there are all kinds of different brands of them out there. You've got to remember it's silica, which is the organic form of silicon. And do you'll find these advertised waters. There's also teas that are high in uh, silica. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can find it. And what well, you were mentioning. Well, part of the ad, the advertisement, they'll, they'll tell you that there's the tea contains silica yeah. or the water contains silica. So right. it's not hard to find. Non-toxic, relatively cheap, inexpensive. Why not? I, you know, I, I would. And, but the main thing is to not get aluminum into your body. It's not a nutrient. There's no requ no requirement for aluminum for the body. So stay away from the pots and pans, the the antiperspirants. You know, that's the way you... This has become a, another real popular issue is the antiperspirants. So anyway, the antiperspirants all contain aluminum. They spray it in your nose. That's where you really have a, 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 a portal of entry, more so than the gastrointestinal tract. The nose uh, is a more efficient portal of entry of aluminum than the gut is. So don't spray it anymore. Don't mm -hmm. use antiperspirants. So you did say it was no, non-toxic. So there are no side effects if you have too much? That's not that I'm aware of. 
you have to run to the bathroom a lot. <laughs> no, no I, I don't know of any, any adverse effects from silica. But, you know, there's even, Heather, that I have heard about psychiatric water drinkers who drink so much water. These people have a mental illness. They drink so much water that they actually dilute their system and get themselves in trouble. So even water can get you in trouble. <laughs> Uh, but there's nothing in common that I know of silica causing adverse effects. The, the other way to deal with it is use desferoxamine. Desferoxamine is, uh, and it's talked about, I wrote two newsletters, and one of them discusses desferoxamine. And, you, you know, if you get your doctor to order it, I, I certainly would do that. If Mary or I had Alzheimer's or any indication, I would get desferoxamine. I wouldn't get these new drugs, the ones that uh, have, a, have shown fewer benefits than desferoxamine. Desferoxamine is gen generic, so there's no profit to be made. The new drugs cost $26,000 a year and $56,000 a year. Lacombe or something is the name? No, I don't remember. I think I'll drink silica water. You, you're supposed to remember uh, these that, things. That's, that's, anyway, remember. it's in the paper, it's controversial. They had a hard time getting it approved, the drug companies did, because so many doctors came out and said, this is useless. It causes swelling of the brain, death, all kinds of crazy stuff. Use desferoxamine if you can get your doctor to help you. If you, you buy it over the internet and uh, take silica water. Don't expose yourself to all of them. Thank you. Next question. This is from Jody, and she has fatty liver, and she with moderate to severe state with fibrosis. Right. And so she's wondering about reversing fatty liver and if she has to worry about her protein intake, even plant protein. Oh, it depends upon how bad her liver function is. And that would be determined by her blood urea nitrogen, BUN, it's on lab test. If she has an elevated BUN, yes, you have to restrict your protein intake because you don't have adequate liver function. The way you cure essentially 100% of the time fatty liver is with weight loss any kind of weight loss, wire your teeth together, go on the Atkins diet, take chemotherapy, take uh, Ozempic, any kind of weight loss will cause you to lose fat under your skin, which is adipose tissue, and to lose fat in the liver. But, but the best way, the safest way, the least expensive and the most permanent and delicious way to lose the excess fat is to eat a uh, starch-based diet. Cure rate, as far as I know, is 100%. The nice thing about the liver is it's very regenerative. So it will grow back. Even if you just have a little piece of it left, it'll grow back. It'll last you a lifetime. I plan on your liver lasting you a lifetime. And if it is already in bad enough shape to have an, an elevated blood urea nitrogen, BUN, simple lab test included, almost every lab test has a BUN on it. Then you have to reduce the protein you take, including the plant. But what you'll learn when you look at my my lecture on liver disease, which is on YouTube, you'll learn that plant proteins are much, much, much kinder to the liver than animal proteins. In fact, studies done where people are in hepatic coma, in other words, they're knocked out, and they switch them from animal protein to vegetable protein diets, they wake up. So that shows you the difference. And all the research is, on, is presented in that presentation on YouTube. You can find it. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, well, more of a statement, but I know you'll have something to say about it. This is from Jeff. And he says, my cardiologist wants my blood pressure to be less than 100 over 70. But, but before I take my meds in the morning, I'm usually 105 over, I'm sorry, 145 over 105. Yeah. What would well, you recommend? I, 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 first, I'd recommend you watch my YouTube presentation <laughs> on hypertension. The second thing I recommend is that you treat blood pressure if it's 160 over 100 or greater sustained. Even, even the most, uh, uh, the, the lowest or, you know, the, uh, the recommendations by the American Medical Association say that you shouldn't start treating high blood pressure unless it's 150 over 90 or greater. And then what you do is you lower it, and you lower it only a little bit. And the reason is, is if you aggressively treat high blood pressure, say you the bottom number you decrease below 85 millimeters of mercury, 
where the top number may be below 120 millimeters of mercury. Then what happens is you decrease because you lower the pressure. You decrease the perfusion pressure to the brain and the heart. And as a result, you increase your risk of dying of heart disease. It's called the U-shaped or the J-shaped curve of mortality, which shows when I have a high pressure, let's say diastolic, the bottom number, say it's 110. Well, it go down to 90, excuse me, down to 100, and then down to 90. And you see a reduction in death. And then at 90, 85, 80, it's you know, kind of the bottom of the curve. And then you start getting more aggressive, 75, 70, 60. You start dramatically increase your risk of dying of heart disease. You increase your risk of dying of stroke at least twofold. And you increase your risk of dying of heart disease about fourfold. So don't do it. Don't, tr don't treat aggressively. Those, those scientific papers, which you should, you know, after this presentation, go to YouTube. Look it up, hypertension and McDougall. Shows you the J-shape, U-shape, care of mortality. Gives you the references. Print out those papers. I showed you how to do it. Take them to your doctor and say, what about this? Because you're the one that's going to get hurt. Not your doctor. You're the one that's going to get hurt. Your doctor is not following the recommendations of the uh, Cochrane Collaboration, the National Health Service of Britain, or the American Medical Association. So if your doctor doesn't know any better, you, you are responsible for saving yourself and your family. I'll give you the research. Discuss it with the doctor. It might make the doctor mad, but you know, doctors are a dime a dozen. So <laughs> go find another one. Thank you. I shared that link in the chat for right, that good. video on YouTube. Okay, next question. This is from BLK. They've been following the McDougall diet for two years. They have type 2 diabetes and can't seem to lose the last 15 pounds. Their A1C is 6.7. Not on any meds, 78 years old. What are they doing wrong? Well, I, you know, first, first thing you need to do is really sit down and decide that you're following the program as suggested. There's so many people who are are not following the diet because we haven't taught them the diet effectively enough. They haven't learned it effectively enough. And so, uh, although they may think they're doing what they should do, you know, vegetable oil is okay. Couldn't be bad. It comes from a vegetable. Or, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a vegan cheesecake. That couldn't be so bad. It's vegan. So, uh, first of all, I'd looked at the, the basic strictness of the McDougall diet. Starches, vegetables, and fruits. If you need to lose weight, you avoid nuts and seeds and avocados. Get a little exercise, that might help. And then what you're going to, you, 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 we have two approaches for you to take to make weight loss more efficient for you. And they're just behavioral things. Rarely are they needed, but often they're desired and, and people resort to them. So we teach them a lot. They're Mary's mini diet. And there's the Maximum Weight Loss Program. They're both on the website. And I'll tell you about the Maximum Weight Loss Program, and I'll let Mary tell you about many. <laughs> maximum Weight Loss Program is a, a diet that is based on starch and non-starchy vegetables like kale and broccoli and cauliflower and lettuce and celery, et cetera. All right, the basic McDougall diet is, say, 90% starch, 10% of green and yellow vegetables and fruits. When you go on the maximum weight loss program, what you do is you decrease the starch to 75%. And the uh, green and yellow vegetables become 25%. And you cut the fruit back. So say from, say, three or four a day to zero or one a day. So that's the next maneuver. And then the next maneuver and the furthest I think you ought to go, because you're not going to be satisfied if you go further than 50%, is you go half and half, starch and green and yellow vegetables. Cut the fruits down. Make sure you even have the simple sugars out of the diet. You can eat uh, you can eat monotonously. That helps. And we're going to talk about it with the mini diet. You can eat frequently. You can take the salt out of the food so it doesn't taste as good. There's a whole bunch of different things you can do. And it's called the Maximum Weight Loss Program. So, Mary, tell us about well, the Mary Mini. Before I want, I just want to mention one thing. Heather, how many people have we had come through the program and say, I've been on the diet 
for two or three years and I'm still not doing as well as I would like to. And at the end of the 12 days with us, they say, oh, I learned so much. I thought I was doing everything perfectly. And there was just a couple of things that I didn't get right. And I lost six pounds yeah. <laughs> during so, the 12 days. It makes yeah. a huge amount of difference. And we hear it all the time that people say that we're doing the program, but we're just not getting what we think we ought to. Yeah, and right. There's just maybe one or two little things. But Mary's Mini, I mean, we have a whole course on Mary's Mini. So it, it's, and isn't this, there's something online also, Heather, about Mary's Mini? So it's easy to there follow. Sure is. Yeah, I'll share some links in the chat. Yeah, basically, it's just you choose one starch. And that's the starch that you eat for the next 10 days. And you eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's the only starch you get. If you choose potatoes, you have potatoes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you can add some simple green or yellow or red vegetables with it. But, you know, no gravies and heavy sauces. Salsa is okay. And, you know, a few little things. But um, it's, it's pretty basic. See, when you add variety to the diet, people eat more. It's just you know, what we find by scientific studies. And so this avoids the variety and um, extremely effective way. Oh, and, pe and people ask all the time, well, can I choose potatoes one day and rice the next day and then maybe corn the next day? But that's not the mini that's diet. Not the, <laughs> that's not the mini diet. Yeah. And you're on it's, the maximum weight loss. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, we call it a diet, by the way, because, you know, there's nothing we have to apologize for the basic McDougal program, which has you know, hundreds, if not thousands of starches that you can pick and, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of different fruits and green, yellow vegetables and spices. And you can lose a little salt, and a little simple sugar. <laughs> you know, our basic diet is really, really tasty. It's the things you give up or you give up the disgusting secretions. So called milk. You can't you can't enjoy them unless you add sugar to them, like ice cream or salt and make cheese. Otherwise, you wouldn't eat these things or or muscles of animals, which are pretty bland or and or disgusting. You, know, you cover them up with ketchup and steak sauce. So we're just getting rid of the disgusting things, <laughs> and then you have your health back. How could it be so easy? And doesn't cost any either. The same would cut your food bill. Yeah. Okay, next question. We've got eight minutes, so I'm going to try to fit a few more in here. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any opinions about um, a low histamine diet for allergies? I, I don't know enough about it. I, I, I certainly have looked at it before. I can't re not remember enough to, to talk about it. But if you have allergies, uh, the, the, th the way I would search it out is with... Uh, there's a, uh, a dietary program that's in my May 2014 newsletter. It's called the Elimination Diet, May 2014 newsletter. And, and that's the diet based upon finding out allergies in people, which was a big deal back in the early 1900s. They used to have wards where they would, uh, uh, they would clean up the air, uh, clean up all the bed linen, feed you a really simple diet the kind of diet that I talked about in my May 2014 newsletter, the elimination diet. And based upon that work, which used to deal with particularly autoimmune diseases or other chronic allergy symptoms, such as asthma, uh, a stuffy nose, that kind of thing. <clears throat> based upon that work that was done, you know, at least a hundred years of work, you know, I put together the elimination diet, which I've used and helped a lot of people. But they're, they're at the end of their wits. You know, they, they've tried basically everything else. And the elimination diet is a pretty fast way to go through the food. Uh, you can make changes every four to seven days. And it basically starts out with rice, sweet potatoes, taro, a couple other starches, which are the least likely starches to cause an allergy. They're green and yellow vegetables and non-citrus fruits. Everything is thoroughly cooked and water is your beverage. And if you get well, then you know it's something in the diet. You know, that's just short of fasting for a week or two, water fasting. That's another way to figure out 
there's something in your diet because you're not eating. But this is a, a kinder way to do it with an elimination diet. And just as effective, just as fast. And certainly you can do this on your own. So you add, add, add suspected foods back every four to seven days and find out what troubles you and what doesn't. That's the way to go about it is with, with the elimination diet, not with testing, but not with any other diets that I know of. The elimination diet is the most powerful one. But um, what you'll probably find out is the histamine diet, if it works, incorporates a lot of the things that I talk about. Thank you. Okay, next question. We haven't gotten this one before. Uh, Peter wants to know, uh, he says, eating the McDougal diet, I noticed my heat tolerance is so much better than it ever was. Is this a common phenomenon among McDougalers? Well, I'd have to, I'd have to do a poll. <laughs> I assume that they're talking about summer heat and, and being warm. Well, you know, they always joke about uh, having that extra layer of fat so that you don't get cold in the winter. Could that be it? <laughs> you know, because he's lost so much weight that he, you know, he doesn't have that uh, that extra layer oh, of fat. His question, his question is saying that um, the way that we recommend people eat, um, people get um, more, more heat. heat. They're they're more, more sensitive tolerant. to heat. They're they're more tolerant. Less. They don't. It doesn't bother them as much. Well, yeah. it may be just you know the fact that that layer of fat provides a layer of insulation, which you know makes it easier to keep a body temperature, but uh, so, I, so I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know of any other mechanism. Well, that's an interesting question, though. I like that. But I don't particularly notice it. I mean, that well, we, but we feel, well, we've been this way forever. Well, we I'm just trying to think. To compare it to, we'd have to I'm talk sorry. to someone who... We don't have a lot of overweight friends either. <laughs> Everybody in our family's trim. I, like I say, we just spent two weeks for a family vacation. Nobody complained about the heat in Hawaii. <laughs> Okay, we've got three minutes. I think I can fit in a couple more questions, at least one more. This is from A. Gray. Does not having a gallbladder affect your absorption of vitamin D? Well, it's produced, produced by the skin, so it wouldn't have any effect. Uh, as far as taking it as a fat-soluble pill, I, I can't really think of any way. What would it do if you say, you know, because they're capsules of oil, what would happen is when you took in this oil, is the liver would produce more bile acids to digest that oil. So the, dial, the, the bile acids, because of the oil, and you don't have a gallbladder, so the, the bile acids can't be stored between meals. They keep dripping into the intestinal tract all day long, and they end up getting into the large intestine where they irritate the large intestine and cause horrible diarrhea you know, 20 stools a day, water, explosive stools. So from any oil, you get that particular problem. But if it's just vitamin D from the sun, it shouldn't matter. No, because that doesn't, that doesn't ever go to the gut. It goes, goes to the liver and the kidneys. Once it's made in the skin, it goes to the livers and kidneys for further metabolism, and then it affects the whole body. So there is a, a but I don't know of any involvement of the gastrointestinal tract that I can think of right now. Okay, thank you. Do you think we have time for one more? Why well, not? Just, yeah. okay, I'll be fast. Okay. <laughs> um, will this will a starch based diet help with pulmonary arterial hypertension? Yes, <laughs> but it's based on you know my experience. I'd have to look and see if there's any literature that supports it. But yeah, we it, it because for the same reasons it helps our arterial hypertension. And that is you reduce peripheral resistance. Um, in this case, it would be in the lung. And if you eat a high-fat diet, what happens is you decrease lung function by about 20% after a single high-fat meal. So, you know, uh, I would expect it to get better. And of course, then you have to monitor it and so on. There are, there are, as, far, as far as I remember, there are very few drug therapies when it comes to pulmonary hypertension. This involves the left the left heart, uh, which involves the lungs, excuse me, the right heart, which involves involves the lungs, and the regular hypertension involves the left side of the heart, which, um, you know, this is the blood pressure you measure in the arm. So this has to do with lung function and venous return and so on. 
Sounds like a whole nother lecture yeah. topic we can get into on a Sunday night. Try and see if I can find any literature that would support treating pulmonary hypertension. But, you know, we've had some cases that have been resolved and of people. I'd expect so. Just like, uh, just like the pressure in the eye when people have uh, glaucoma. So that's reduced. The pressure in all the, the whole system is reduced. You take the salt out, you decrease the volume load, you decrease the perfor peripheral resistance by ways that I've talked to you about just over the last three weeks. And, uh, you know, losing weight, of course, always helps. Good. Well, we got them all in, Heather. That's it, <laughs> six o'clock. Perfect timing. We have, we have a program coming up in July. So what was the date? Well, we have one more um, Sunday night meeting before the program starts. Right, well, I want to get them we signed do. up. Just We're like going to be said. busy. We've got our 12-day, July 14th through the 25th. Then we start the first uh, session of your five-part medicine series, July 29th. And that'll be running for five summer. consecutive weeks all summer. No. So we'll be busy. No, I'm, having, I'm really working hard on that because my goal is to help my colleagues understand diet therapy and help them have a practice that where they'll feel really good. I mean, most general practitioners, internists, family practitioners, they have a pretty tough time enjoying their business because the patients never get well. They just get drugged and they just get a bunch of excuses. It's not satisfying for the doctors. So I'm putting in these five lectures that will go to my colleagues. They're CME. So they have a continuing medical education, which all doctors like to have. And I'm going to try and get these paid for by our foundation. So they won't even have to pay for them. It usually costs 10, 20 bucks a credit. But you also want to make sure that people understand these, these um, talks that you're giving are not just for doctors. Everybody's going to be able to understand. Them. Oh, well, look, <laughs> if your speaker can't talk to you, then your speaker doesn't understand the topic. I understand I the top. That's true. So I'll be talking to everybody at every level, whether you have heart disease or diabetes or cancer, or, or subjects we're going to cover. Or weight loss, and of course you'll be interested in that one that we're going to start it out with. So yeah, it's it's for the lay public very much so. But the detail I'm going into with references and getting it CME approved, which is quite expensive, to help my colleagues get uh, interested to take advantage because once they see it. No, I, I imagine unless you, you're, you're just so biased about standard medicine, you're going to change your practice or at least try. At least you're going to say to a few patients who say, Doc, couldn't I do something else? Couldn't I avoid heart surgery? Couldn't I live longer with my cancer? Couldn't I be a, a non-type 2 diabetic? And occasionally somebody will say that to you as a doctor. And you'll be right there. I know what to do. I, do, I can help you. Because of the education we give them. And the other, the other uh, 30 people they see <laughs> during the day, you can drug them all day long, make money. <laughs> but you get to talk to one. All right. Well, thank you for that hour, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you all next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.